Hello, people. Today, again, second day with Alexander. People, again, today, talking about cultural art in general and the book, a little bit more specific, and other topics we did not cover yesterday. And I think we're going to spend probably the first 20 minutes covering a few topics we talked about yesterday and we did not bring to the camera, but they are very interesting and related to the subject. And the first one would be the <clears throat> one of the questions I asked uh, Alex was about um, I see a movement of uh, culture and ideas from North America to South America. Oh, just a minute. There you go. Oh, you want to say bye bye to mommy? Come here. Boy, boy, mommy. Oh my gosh, are you sad because you're going away? Yeah. No, but bye, she's going to be boy. back. Bye bye, Shiva. <laughs> you're so beautiful. <laughs> okay, bye bye. So, yeah, my perspective of uh, the ideas are going in a way from United States to South America. So when we receive the things in Brazil, nowadays that we do have the internet, we can go and check that those matters or those subjects or papers, studies or whatever, are coming from like months or some like sometimes year ago. And I was like, oh, so it came from America. So now I see, now that I'm here in Canada, I see people talking about the culture war and I've seen reaching there, like, for example, the gender pronouns mm -hmm. was something yep. that recently I saw people talking about this on Facebook and other uh, platforms. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've seen this month ago in the United States. And I asked Alex how he sees that because he is in UK, if that is coming from Britain, United States or from America to UK. Um, yeah, I think you're, I think this idea is, is generally right. It's, it seems to be coming from America. It also is reaching Britain slightly later, but I think that everyone in the Anglosphere, so that's Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they get it slightly after America. So America sets up these ideas and you have the and Hollywood I mean Hollywood isn't what it was but it's still a great sort of transmitter of ideas and of culture um, and I think it, it reaches us slightly later but we absorb it before the non-English speaking countries um, but now I think that cycle is getting shorter and shorter so that countries in South America are, are getting this information and getting these papers and getting these uh, topics uh, only you know a few months uh, after they have surfaced in the English-speaking world. And I think, you know, the, 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 the pronoun thing as well is something that started in America. And it's, it's come over to Britain. And, of course, it's being transmitted through Twitter, which, you know, has a universal, um, has, a, has universal rules and so forth, and the other social medias and so forth. So there's no, there's no avoiding it, really. Uh, even, even if you want to, it, it, it does impact you, but... Uh, I think that we've we've just learned to adjust to that, but I do think that it is meeting more resistance in Britain than it is in America. But it's it's hard to tell. Yeah, that is an interesting thing because I even raised the hypothesis. Maybe it's like a, an English thing. Maybe it happens all together. Maybe there is like a America and Britain, but even the like you say, a Britain comes after America is more powerful on the speech or it's louder and then brings to Britain and also gets less support in Britain when like but, people in but, Britain but, would be but, less woke. Yes, but that, that's true. So the, there's less political correct, correctness in most of Britain. But I would say that you have a problem in that the Americans have uh, laws uh, in favor of free speech. They have the, the Bill of Rights. Uh, we don't have that in Britain. So we have this problem that we don't have a constitutional guarantee of uh, free speech in Great Britain. And of course, that's uh, causing lots of problems uh, for free speech advocates um, and for people who just um, want free discussion of ideas in universities and in public spaces. Um, because you, now you find that people are a little bit afraid to speak on certain topics in public spaces. 
um, because we don't have this uh, protection of free speech here. Yeah, yeah, that is is a, another point. Is that is the other side? Even if people in Britain are not that woke, they don't feel free to actually speak their mind because the government could come after them. And we, we mentioned this out of the cameras as well. It's about uh, Count Dankula that I asked if you if you knew Count Dankula or Sargon of Akkad that or <laughs> around there and talk about those type of things as well. Yeah, because free and, speech is their big subject. And, and Count Dankula has been persecuted because of jokes. And one of the things we see it's like, for me, uh, I just think it's such a dissonant reality that we have gone through dictatorship so close, you know, like my, our, my parents lived into dictatorship in Brazil during the dictatorship period. And we are regressing to some type of censorship, like just like the things we saw in history and it's like we're supposed to not repeat and we have talked about this just a bit ago you know decades ago and we're like why are we going through this online now it's not that is a new universe that we should change the rules we have to stick with the principle of the free speech i think no I matter think what one of one of our problems is that we are uh, we're temporal we're temporal bigots, we're snobs. We think that because we know a little bit about history, we are not going to make the same mistakes. That, you know, if we had been in Nazi Germany, we would have been free speech advocates. We would have fought and stood up for the Jews and for the communists and for gays and gypsies and so forth. And we would have, we would have risked our lives. And the truth is that very few of us would have done that. And I think that we tend to look back on these things. So past dictatorships, um, so obviously in, in Brazil, that was in the 1970s, I think. Um, and you think, well, you know, we're not, we, we, we've made progress. So we've gone forward since then. We're never going to go back. We're never going to slip back into a period of censorship. But of course, um, I don't think there's anything guaranteed about that at all. I think that what happens is that you get people saying, oh, well, we're just protecting the vulnerable. We're protecting the marginalized. We're, we're supporting vulnerable communities. And of course, that's what every, every dictator, every uh, authoritarian says that, oh, you know, we're doing this to protect. Okay, and in some cases, they may be saying, oh, we're doing it to protect the ethnic, the indigenous mi minority against uh, a majority against these, these, um, these strange outsiders who come in with new ideas. And in other cases, it can, it can be people who are saying, oh, we're trying to protect the minorities and so forth. Um, but I think it's just simply a diff different ways of justifying being more authoritarian and being controlling. It, it is very dissonant. I don't know if it involves a little bit like it, it's all linked together because it is this correct and this PC culture, the, the po political correctness that will come and say like, oh, we're not going to try to even erase history. It's like, oh, let's not talk about Hitler because Hitler was just a Nazi and don't even understand how he got the power to be there. And they are actually trying to use the same type of uh, method to fight. There is, the there is, yes, there is, so this, <laughs> there is this idea about, um, about historical reparations and about fighting historical injustice. So there is this whole idea about moving objects in museums in the West back to the countries of origin. And uh, the way I see it is that this is uh, just a, a form of enacting some sort of historical vengeance on the past, on people who are long dead, on cultures that are long gone, on empires that have been gone for you know, 50, 100 years. And yet the people today, they still want, they still want that sort of little rush of dopamine when they manage to click on a button and say, send back this artifact to this country when, you know, actually the the artifact was lawfully traded, it was actually a gift. Um, yeah, but, yeah. The, the, but there is this there is this idea to enact historical vengeance to try and retroactively alter history. Um, and so recently there was a, an article that I read by um, Anthony Daniels, uh, the Theodore Dalrymple, who wrote the introduction to my book. And he was writing about architecture and he was talking about the way lots of Victorian architecture in Britain has been 
um, erased, being destroyed um, over well, over the last 50 years, not, not recently, but over the last 50 years, and that this um, seems to be an attempt to sort of wipe out a whole period of history. And I feel like, well, this is, this is another example of us wanting, of the, the politically correct left wanting to destroy remnants of a period when Britain was almost all Christian, it was almost all white, it was almost all, um, you know, conventional in terms of its um, uh, marriage morality and so forth. This was a period of homogeneity and the people today, they, they despise it, they hate it, they, it's, it's the absolute opposite of what they want. Um, so actually knocking down these buildings is symbolic of knocking down that history and erasing that culture. Uh, and I think you, you find this in so many areas, in museums, in architecture, in art, in literature. Um, uh, so I think that if you're looking closely and you know what to spot, you can see this happening in lots of different places. Yeah, it's very irrational because I think the idea of, uh, you know, the, the idea of how human developed, you know, if you're, re if you're reasonable, if you're rational, you understand that uh, we only made this all what we have today in in construction architecture development science because we managed to collect data we were the only species that could that had a brain to to write you know that we needed the history so prehistorical it's kind of like it was a natural way to get there but uh, from that point on when we start writing and collecting uh, knowledge and accumulating knowledge it was what made us be so great like what we are now and and these people are just irrational like you said is is beliefs or it's political driven it's, it's, it's emotion, emotionally it's emotionally driven. It's, it's some type of extremists that i want to erase history and the same thing with the polit polit political correctness on i need to erase history because this guy was bad it's like, no, no, you need to keep those examples so you know what to not to do. And what what they did, they started with censoring the other side, was to yeah, censor and, the opposition. And, and you, you saw this especially during uh, during the Civil War uh, monuments discussion in America. So in America, there was sort of, I think, two, two, or, two or three years ago, there was this wave of um, uh, attacks on Civil War sculpture and people saying, oh, you know, it, it's it's an insult to, to black people because these were Civil War generals from the South who were fighting for the Confederacy. The Confederacy wanted to maintain slavery. Uh, well, that was one of its aims. Um, and so there was this idea, oh, we have to get rid of them. They are so, they are so shocking. Um, whereas I would say, well, what you do is you keep them and you just contextualize them. You might want to put some sort of um, plaque next to them explaining the situation and leave people to make up their own their own uh, to draw their own morals and their own reading of history but don't start taking things away and then telling us what we should be thinking no leave the things up and allow us to reach our own conclusions i think it's um a lot of it is a fear of people not being able to win an argument through logic and explanation or persuasion mm -hmm. and simply saying that certain things cannot be said and certain things cannot be shown they are so toxic they are they are like um, morally radioactive, they will contaminate the viewer. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and this is all in all the indoctrinations. And I think that we live in a world that a lot of people are trying to do it, you know, in many sense, like politically and religi religiously. And um, yeah, you have so many forces trying to convince people what is true, what is the right way of thinking. And I, I would, and I would is, also... Yeah, I would also add that this also the the right the right wing also do this. So I'm not saying that yeah, this is just sides, that which surely comes from the left. It's the idea of the 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 horse horseshoe. The, yeah, the horseshoe that we'll put them together. They are authoritarian. You can see like the Brazilian government is up up there uh, with the idea of like harming people justified by the idea of like I'm gonna protect you from your own decisions and loses the individuality because they are collective uh, societies. They they, yeah. they think everybody has to think the same. Yeah. 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 So I, I think also I wrote an 
article for uh, ARIO magazine, A-R-E-O, um, which is run by Helen Pluckrose, who you've spoken yeah, to. Yeah, we have um, She's a big advocate of free speech. And I, my article was basically on iconoclasm, and it was saying that iconoclasm is something that's being used. It can be used equally by the left and by the right. So the left tends to want to destroy um, historical things, uh, it, things from eras redolent of imperialism and colonialism and so forth. And the right tends to want to destroy um, modern things, examples of modern art or of contemporary art or of, mo or of recent multiculturalism. They want to destroy these. So um, my, my essay was talking about the power of iconoclasm and iconoclasm is a necessary part of all revolutionary political ideologies. And that comes from the left and the right. This is pretty cool. It is amazing. Yeah, this the, the clash of the court is interesting. The way that we see sometimes centuries because you don't agree with the right or the left and then you like and being at the both. So it's a funny thing we see in Brazil mainly on the culture that is like these young people yeah. The family, the conservative, to the church, the, you know, uh, almost like, like no, not even reasonable because they are following what subjective rules they decide to choose with the idea that is very objective morals. For example, people that try to say like, oh, Bible, and they realize the subjective of it. And the other is very liberal agenda, sometimes like uh, talking about things should be a the you know, like to teaching kids trans things or LGBT uh, papers and to school for small children. And, and and then when I oppose to both sides, it's just, just like, you know, are oh, you bad? complicated but i i think there are the things we can clearly point out wrong from each one of them yeah. <laughs> so a little bit on the colonialism that we mentioned oh no sorry sorry i want to i want to go back on the thing we talked about yesterday because we've spent a few minutes on the the new marvel superheroes and did not reach the ending goal that was i was going to thank you again for bringing me to some new material and new con uh, um, concepts about uh, art because I just found out yesterday reading some matters about the, the new Marvel superheroes that they would be a type of post-ironic model of art and I brought to you and you said you did not know or heard of it and as soon as I explained to you, you said, oh, no, yeah, that makes sense. We have a few examples. And for people that never have heard, I think it's kind of a new uh, term. The post-ironic would be uh, this type of art that when you face, you're not sure if it's serious or if it's mocking the other side the, of the political agenda. So... Uh, I think we have a few examples. I have been sending messages sometimes sporadically to uh, Andrew Doyle and Titania McGrath that I think is probably the best and, you know, great example of, <laughs> of post-ironic yeah, art so this nowadays. Is, so this is, uh, this, is, this is sort of pastiche or parody. Um, and he's, he's, yes, he's famous. He has a character called Titania McGrath who is a, an SJW feminist who lives a very privileged lifestyle. Um, but of course, as a feminist, she can claim that she's oppressed and that she's suffering, and that, but that uh, she's using her position of privilege to be a good ally to minorities and so forth. And this allows her to be patronizing and completely wrong and tone deaf all the time. Um, so I, I, think, I, think that's, uh, I think that that's a very good way of critiquing um, political ideologues who, th who think that they are just 
um, who think that they're morally unassailable. And it's, and it's so difficult to tell whether or not uh, it's real or not real, because there are people who act like this in reality. And then, of course, people who don't know that this is a parody account think it's genuine account. And so they have they have genuine arguments with a parody account. Um, and uh, he's um, uh, Andrew Dwells explained sort of how um, it's it's kind of I think he was a bit disappointed that he he lost he lost the uh, he he was um, outed as the author because uh, he's he's a he's a serious author he's an essayist and so forth and that uh, he was a little bit disappointed that his character had been exposed so that everyone knew it was actually him um, but I, I think he handles it very well and he uses it to critique. Uh, extreme responses from the far left who say, oh, this is completely ridiculous. No one ever says anything like this, except there are lots of people who do. And then he can also um, use it to attack people on the far right as well. Um, so I, I think he, he does it very well. It is pretty good. I follow her on Twitter. I follow both on Twitter. And she, I think it just yesterday, the day before, she, she shared one of those uh, Something like I can't bear white people or something. Like that. The, the, she 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 put up a, a questionnaire. It was a question: What is the greatest threat to humanity? Is it coronavirus or whiteness? <laughs> and I had to vote for one or the other. I think uh, I, I think I know what what her vote would go. To. Uh, yeah. Considering that Corona is not an apocalyptic disease as the mainstream media wants to portray, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> she would be right, <laughs> and she will be right for so many people. Yeah, because um, uh, the whiteness is another thing that is trending. And I asked you if it was appropriate question. Question: Is it okay to be a white male, a straight white male in arts nowadays? How hard is that? Um, well, you know, obviously this is it's a huge historical burden and. You know, I'm I'm suffering daily, so I feel like I'm a marginalised person. But no, not really. I mean, it is true that you do, you get the the the, the politically left people who are running the arts, the public arts. Now, in the private arts, of course, it's much more open that people just follow what really excites them. People follow what makes money. People are a lot more relaxed. But uh, the public arts are funded in part by the government indirectly through the Arts Council. And they're also um, funded through charities. And these charities are often very, very left wing. And they're actually lobbying groups. They're pressure groups, really. Um, so the public arts is very, very political. Um, and you have now you have whole quota systems where the Arts Council basically say to our venues, you have to follow our belief in identity politics and quota politics. You will have to uh, hire so many women, so many um, uh, sexual minorities, so many ethnic minorities and so forth and so forth. And they have these little quotas. And these are all monitored. These are all checked on. And that this is influencing the public arts more and more. And there's this threat that, you know, if you don't, you know, you don't um, hire or you don't exhibit the right number of um, black artists or women artists or lesbians or so forth, that you're going to lose your grant or you're going to have your grant reduced. So naturally, if they know that you are a straight white male, which... I mean, you know, I mean, there are videos of me, there are interviews of me, so you can find out who I am. Um, so when you're applying, you know that your application is going to the bottom of the pile or it's been completely discarded. No matter how good your art is, but it's impossible to prove this. Um, I would say maybe I am a test case in the sense that in the past... Uh, I did quite well as an artist. I had scholarships, I had prizes, I was bought by various museums that you've mentioned at the beginning. I had exhibits in public museums. Since the publication of this book, uh, I've had no offers. I've had people not returning my phone calls, not returning my emails. And yeah, you do. I do feel as though I've gone onto some sort of blacklist because of 
not because of my art, because my art is apolitical. I mean, it's, it's landscapes, it's figures, it's portraits and so forth. There's no narrative, there's no political content to my art. But because I have stood up and said, I don't agree with, uh, quote, politics, I don't agree with um, identity politics, I think that art should be chosen on its merit, please don't patronise people, don't tell people what to think, let's have some real genuine diversity of, of um ideas and of thought in in the arts let's not have this uh, monoculture that we've seen growing up and because i've said all this in the new book um that this has kind of had a hugely adverse effect on my art career even though my art career is completely different from my uh critical career so uh, yes, uh, in, indirectly i think it has it has had an impact on me yeah yeah, and that is really bad, both sides, like the cancel culture, but also the quota programming, because I was always uh, talking about this because they have quota programming in Brazil. They had quota programming in schools, in universities in Brazil to give to, like, a, I was just talking to a friend yesterday. Uh, I remember when I was getting, trying to get into med school, you would have to score around 80 to 86 percent to enter the med school and they had quotas for for black people that for black and, and natives that would need to score like 50 percent and i was like but these people are not going to make a good school in the end because they are not prepared to get into the school and we saw that happening you know the next years we some schools some public schools had to put extra course aside for the students that entered through quotas because they could not follow the the academic studies, the this, the classes, and it, it's just there. They still doing this in Brazil. They are very con uh, the the government is very authoritarian. It's right up there on the on the political compass, and they are always doing things, trying to help people, protecting people. And I was even talking about how condescending and racist was this type of laws. And I was like, and they were like, oh, it's just because you don't want the competition. Like, no, the competition <laughs> is equal the way that it is. We yeah. don't need to give them extra help, yeah. you know, other people. And and we're trying to do the, it's, it's about the merit, it's about how the art is good, it's how, about how much the student study and how much he knows. Mm -hmm. It's not about his genitals or his color or whatever. Yeah. You and, know? And, I, and I would say, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't want, I don't want someone who's been selected on their skin color to fly the airplane I'm in. I want the best pilot, regardless of skin color. I don't care what skin color, I don't care if it's male or female, I don't care if they're gay or straight. I just want the best pilot flying my plane. The problem is that when you talk about the arts, it's not so much, you know, you've got an objective measurement in plane flying, you know, it's you stay in the air, you get from point A to point B and you land safely and you're competent. Um, the problem with the arts is how do you measure it? You know, how, what's the objective measure of a good artist? So now there is, with postmodernism, of course, you don't have a test of skill or a test of competence. It can be basically anything. And if you can, if you can foreground your identity and you're saying, oh, well, my importance as an artist is being gay or being black or being trans, then there's no qualification on terms of merit, in terms of skill or in terms of um, competence. So this really is a big problem for the arts because you can't go into an art gallery and say, well, you can go into an art gallery and say, I don't think that work of art is very successful and here's why, and you're using various arguments to discuss, to, to put it forward. But it's not obvious to anyone walking in. It's not like going in to see if, oh, my doctor, you know, my heart surgeon, I've got two heart surgeons and one of them's got a great, a greater percentage rate of survivals than the other one. So clearly this guy is either getting much luckier or he's more competent. You can't really do that with the arts. And so that's why it's so easy to manipulate and to coerce people in the arts in terms of putting forward people in terms of their identity and not in terms of their competence. And that's a real problem when you're having discussions like me about why was I not chosen for this exhibition, but someone else was chosen? And of course, there is this danger that you could always fall into this trap of saying, oh, I wasn't selected because I was white and male and straight. And then, of course, that might not be true. It might simply be that, you know, you're 
you're you're angry about it, you're disappointed about it, or that the other person was better and you just didn't couldn't admit it and so forth. So it's a really difficult argument to make. So I, I tend not to discuss my own personal situation uh, in terms of judging art, but obviously as an artist, it, it impacts me every day. Yeah, in 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 Brazil about the for example black quotas on schools, I I thought was more harmful to the black people that would go through school without using quotas and then later be misjudged by the person receiving the product. You know, someone that was like, oh, I don't want a black doctor because I know they enter by quotas, and there is a black doctor that did not get into quotas and suffers that prejudice later because of the program oh. and in case of the arts i think is another type of uh, an analysis because i don't see like, like it, yeah it's very subjective and you always can fall into the victimhood uh excuse that oh i was not select because of my gender because of my color and that is pretty easy to live like that but also, if there is such a, a force or endeavor into arts to really push and exclude the the white ma the white straight male, I think it is bad because then you, is that we're not starting from the same point as we supposed to. So you actually like, oh no, I'm not gonna even give him chance, and then in the end you could like end up find out that everybody else that you analyze and you did find some good art because. Well, I think art is very subjective, and like I said, you can like just enter in a room and like, oh, I like this, but would not maybe that guy that was excluded because of his color and his gender and his sexuality not have something better than this? So that yeah. is. I think I think you, you're when you're putting forward these arguments that uh, Thomas Sowell and Larry Elder and Coleman Hughes. Oh yeah, forward. I love them too. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did not watch them talking about this specific, but I follow them. It's just I follow so many people, and I, I really <laughs> look up to so many yeah. people. I get to watch everything. So, so, so they're they're putting forward exactly your point that this is this is really damaging to people who were subjected to quotas, and now it's happening with arts as well. You go into a museum and you see a wall full of uh, art by women and. There is an automatic assumption because we all know that the quotas exist. We all know that they're applied. If they're official or unofficial, it doesn't matter. We all know that these quotas exist. So when we see this line of, of women artists, their art on the wall, there is an automatic assumption they're there to hit a quota because the press department is going to, is going to issue uh, a, a breakdown of race and gender on their on their, you know, on their press releases, they're going to say, "Oh, this is the most, uh, this is the the most uh, female uh, uh, representative uh, open exhibition that we've ever mounted." Sixty-two percent of all the art exhibited is by women, and it's like, well, is that a coincidence, or is that one of the reasons why these artists were selected? And it's the same for black artists as well, uh, and black intellectuals and black doctors. Yeah. Am I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I've uh, interviewed, for example, one of the things I wanted to ask you is that thing about the subjective and objectivity on the arts. And uh, I think the arts is very subjective because, I don't know, we look, I normally go through things and it's like, ah, I think this is artistic or this is pretty. And sometimes you can find an artifact, a tool or whatever, and feels like this is so artsy. You know, but as a decoration, this is some kind of a human natural uh, behavior, you know, even like a caveman or like a, the old prehistoric uh, historian uh, civilization. I saw a video recently from Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about this and saying that the the first shack or whatever they would imagine and they have an idea of what it looked like already had some teeth of animals and stuff like decorating and I feel like uh, I I've interviewed recently uh, Chantel that is uh, from here locally I was for in Canada BC and I met her in the TEDx in the city or her husband and then I went through her Instagram and I was just I fell in love for her art her style she's native and she's all into the identity politics of course you know because it's the way that they actually make uh, people actually I think would reach to her and say like come to the woman's art museum or 
she because of her uh, her heritage as well, she already had all this influence in in her art. So it, it ends up getting it. But I was like totally into like this subjectivity of art. I was like, I'm really not in identity politics. I I am really enjoying her arts and getting posters and stuff to put here, for example. And uh, and I think this is something interesting to say. Like, can you bring us a little bit on this? How objective or subjective the arts are, or and how can we measure? Them? Well, as my job as a as writer critic. Is, is to be is to be a critic. <laughs> so I'm not really an art historian. I'm not doing much uh, original research. I'm not going to archives and going through old books and saying. Okay, well, this artist was born in this place, and he worked for this this um, patron, and so forth. So I'm not doing the art historical side. I have done it occasionally, but my most of my work is as an art critic, which is to judge how successful um, a piece of art is. Now, obviously, you're comparing it to other pieces by that same artist. You're also talking about how is it in relation to its style? Is it a good re- is it a good example of its style? Is it an interesting hybrid? Is it doing effectively what the artist, what I think the artist meant to do. Um, And then I say, well, why is it effective? Why is it not effective? Often in terms of um, uh, a painting I'm talking about, well, okay, why does this picture work better for me than that other picture? And so I'll say, well, you know, in terms of perception or in terms of colour, in terms of movement, you know, I'm getting certain things from this picture and that's why it's successful and the other picture is not doing it quite as well or it's a little bit more muddy or confused or this isn't really the artist's strength this is this is more of the artist's strength and this one is not so much um so you you you're obviously you you have subjective criteria but you're seeing if the artist is the art the artwork is meeting that subjective criteria in a measured way in a way that you can explain so it's both very subjective and then both quite objective in terms of measuring how successful it is in terms of those subjective qualities. Uh, um, so that's not really a very useful way of discussing it. But, um, you know, in terms of objective, I think there are certain things that you can talk of in, 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 in objective terms. Like, so, for example, if you have a, a narrative picture, which is from the 19th century, or 18th century, you can say, or oh, this picture is particularly effective because you can see the glance of the woman is at this uh, is at the man's hand and the man is holding a goblet in a certain way, or you have certain symbolism like Dutch still lives. Certain every, you know almost every object in the Dutch still life has a symbolic meaning, so if it's combined in the right way, you know ah okay so they're, they're giving you a moral, they're talking about vanitas, they're talking about uh, hubris, they're talking about um, memento mori. And so if you talk about it in terms of something with an established symbolism, symbolism or a religious picture, so you can, you can read it in terms of, oh, are they effectively conveying the theology that they want to convey? Are they um, um, striking a powerful emotion in this, uh, in this picture? Or in, if it's uh, a narrative picture, you can say, is it telling the story effectively? Am I understand, do I understand the story effectively? just from looking at the picture. So those are ways that you can talk of more objective ways of judging art. I really like to, uh, I've, I have been following a lot of artists on Twitch. It's something very trending on Twitch nowadays. Artists coming to make like, normally uh, design graphic, making like animation or whatever. But even like paint, people painting, I think, uh, I suggested Chantal to do that. And I see them making those analysis, men on the picture saying like, I'm, I'm reading the message or is there some object in the picture that gets more your attention? Is that where you really... So they do make that more objective analysis, but there is always this subjectivity of like, just like the colors, just feels like good, feels like this or that. You know, so it, it brings some... Um, yeah, it raise some feelings or or raises some some something on people, and I I don't know if uh, that is 
such a such a thing. I really would like to in, to also invite people to watch the conversation with Benjamin because you guys made more an analysis on even he put pictures and then you talked about some pictures it was really nice and I don't want to go over the same things but I think there was such a thing you talked there that I would like to cover again that is the intention of the artist because there is there are arts nowadays that for you as critics that is easy you analyze the objectivity of the art just don't even know the arts is fine but then the subjectivity would be analyzed if the the person the artist really um put or managed to 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 take the you know to to put into the art what he he wanted is something like that is is a would be that the subjectivity of the art yeah Analysis. well i it's my criteria and that is lost with many arts as well because we have so many old arts nowadays that we appreciate but we don't even know what was the purpose of the artist to yeah, make yeah we don't we don't it's even know it, sometimes and you're yeah. like oh this is just so beautiful <laughs> yeah was well, so like so for the so as i discuss in the book the talk about i talk about you know you can go back to very very old art and it might not even be art at all it might be because we don't know about what was going on in that culture. Maybe they don't have any written records or we don't have complete written records. We don't know if this object was supposed to be art or if it was supposed to perform some practical function. Maybe it was like a, a mystical machine for communicating with the spirit world or if it was a symbolic, if it was to do with hierarchy, social status, in the same way that, you know, sort of certain types of clothing might be hierarchy status as well. You know, like a, a crown would show that you were a king. You know, having a certain kind of sculpture might suggest that you had a certain social status or that you come from a certain lineage. So it was sort of to do with your family. So there's all sorts of things about really ancient artifacts that we don't know. Um, and we do, And it's very difficult to judge what the intention of the artist was because we don't even know if it's art, we don't know how it was supposed to be viewed, we don't know if it's supposed to be viewed at all, it might have been a sacred thing, it might have been uh, a grave good, so it wouldn't have been seen by anyone at all, so it would have been buried, uh, or it might have been part of a religious um, ritual or something like that. Um, so uh, my criteria for good art is something that you could bury in the ground for a hundred years or a thousand years and you dig it up without knowing anything about the, the original culture, and yet it still moves you. It's still emotional, it's still powerful, it's still striking, it's still beautiful. And that would be a good criteria for art. And I think that that is also an interesting criteria because it also means that conceptual art is not art at all. Because conceptual art depends on you understanding something else that's not contained in the object. It's contained, with the, it's contained in a text or an explanation or a general social attitude that you know already that you can apply to this art. So that's that's my criteria for art is that you can, it, it exists, it's inherent in the physical object. That is and, a pretty good one. Oh, thank that's you. That's a pretty good explanation. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I think it's you also, you've got to think about like, uh, because we now we have postmodern art, we have ironic art. You know, you talked about post-ironic comic book art. Uh, and the problem with ironic art is that it seems like it's almost a tactic that's in designed to defend you. So if you look at the art and you say, oh, that's not very good, then the, the artist can simply say, oh, well, it wasn't meant to be. That's the point. It's ironic. It's supposed to be bad. Um, and you think, well, actually, did you really mean it to be ironic? Because if someone said that's a beautiful work of art, that's moving, that's amazing, that's so personal to me, would you have really said, oh, no, it's actually ironic? Would you have actually said, yeah, actually, I meant it to be moving and amazing and to have a real connection with you? So the ironic thing is, it does seem like a, a defense tactic rather than an intellectual, a, a genuine intellectual statement. Um, yeah, and, and that's, the, and that's how we get on to the subject. It depends on the perspective of the interlocutor. Yeah. Yeah, that that is, it ended up with the ironic and pose ironic the same way yeah. and, and we, we talked about pose law as well didn't we yes Where the parody of the original the original is so extreme that the parody gets mis mistaken for the original so it becomes like what's genuine and what's fake um and we see that on the internet all the time 
yeah, I don't know. I think uh, the Paul's law would be more like no matter what you say, someone will understand that wrongly. And and I think it, it happens like it's some natural thing. I, I've talked to uh, a Brazilian comedian. He makes a parody character of uh, an evangelist pastor. And I asked him in the interview if there was some anybody from his hundred more than a hundred thousand followers that takes him serious and like, oh yeah a lot of people actually ask me to pray for them and i was like oh no and, <laughs> and that is interesting but and um the the perception of the audience you know the audience perception of the art sometimes is uh, it changed through i think changed through time or I don't know. One thing I read yesterday, I was going through art and history stuff and reading about Schubert, that his piece is the most famous ones. Like after he died, they published a few ones, small ones that were not really nice. And the good pieces that we enjoy so much nowadays, they were considered wasted paper by the publishers at the time. And I was like, you see, so art's very yeah. subjective. You, you get the same in the art and the, in the fine arts as well. So you have like um, Constable, the famous uh, English uh, landscape artist, um, that he used to do six foot large paintings, like two meter wide paintings, grand landscapes for big public exhibitions. But he would also do these uh, sketches that were quite rough and impressionistic, just so he could lay out the, the various parts of the composition, so he could just judge the colors and so on. Uh, and nowadays, many people prefer these rough pieces that were never supposed to be exhibited to the final pictures that all of uh, Turner's contemporaries, uh, sorry, Constable's contemporaries, thought were the most amazing. Um, so it's, it's, it's to do with taste, again. But you need to move forward on this thing on arts that artists will want to only be famous after they die. <laughs> what, is, what, is, what is that culture or this thing? Well, I think, I, well, it comes, it comes from the, the legend of Van Gogh. So Van Gogh was a great artist. He was largely neglected during his lifetime. He died aged 40 or 41 um, by suicide. It, we're fairly sure it's suicide. There's some talk about it being an accident, but it's probably suicide. And he certainly was suicidal at times also. And so there is this idea that, well, you know, he, is, he has become the most influential of the, of the modern artists. He's the but he's not only the most influential, but he's the most beloved. He's beloved by the public. So a lot of people will object to Picasso and Matisse and Mondrian, but fewer people will object to Van Gogh because his work is um, it's colourful, it's representational, it's of um, subjects that are traditional, it's easily comprehensible. So. And he has been such a great influence and been so acclaimed that now there is this idea of the cursed painter um, who only becomes recognized after his death. And that's related, I think, very much to the story of Van Gogh. Although, actually, if you find you read about it, Van Gogh was quite appreciated by a small circle of insiders before he died. Um, but, uh, but generally, the, the myth is true. Uh, but there was one aspect of the myth that's not true, that's specific to Van Gogh, and that was that he was this he was this wild man that he was painting crazily. That he was, you know, because you get this from the <clears throat> from the 1950s film with uh, Kirk Douglas, uh, where he's where he's out in the out in the wheat fields and he's slashing away and he's 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 painting like a madman. He's so intense. But actually, what you find is that Van Gogh is very very methodical. He's very thorough. He applies his paint fast, but he's thinking very carefully. He's chosen his colors very carefully. He's demarcated, demarcated his areas of the composition very carefully. Um, so actually, although he was painting with a lot of passion, he was never uncontrolled when he was actually painting. So that's um, one of the little myths about Van Gogh. Um, one of the great experiences of my life, as, just as, as a person, was I got to tour the Van Gogh Museum uh, with one curator. And the museum was closed. And I was there alone with the curator and we could just walk through these galleries. Wow. 
and that was that was just such that was such an incredible experience. I was so lucky. Wow, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, so um, let's talk a little bit about the book. Some <laughs> hot topics now. <laughs> And and it's funny because I feel like we did not get out of the first chapter. <laughs> it's just so dense. People, go check. Culture Wars is amazing. Uh, one of the things right in the beginning, and I think it's very important we see this, it's one of the strongest forces, in my opinion, for the censorship nowadays, is the fear, is this fear mongering of like, you're going to say something wrong, so don't even say we are all going through this type of fear. I, I, I sometimes I feel like that. I before in asking people things, I will start with like, should I ask you this? I don't know. Don't, don't you mind to share the, no things that and and that is um, sub ends up subconscious. Like we're doing all that already because mm -hmm. of this fear. And it started with. Uh, uh, in religions, talking, you know, I'm an atheist and I always talk about this because there is a big force, whatever there is a big uh, religious community, even if they are not extremists. Uh, I lived in Brazil, 86% of the population believes in gods or some god. And, um, and it's a, a big issue to come out of the closet. Personally mm. speaking, I have experienced that in Brazil. That's why I moved out of Brazil as well. So, and you talk about this, the a little bit of multiculturalism, the Islamism, and the, even what I thought I liked the most was when you talk about the, psychologically what explains, what justifies their, their extremists and their bad thoughts and justifies violence against other people. And I have talked to so many people about how we should be more reasonable on the response on being on bullying. Like if we, you get offended, the maximum that you should do is to try to offend the person back and not to punch them in the face. No, not go for physical attack when you're being offense, offended by words. And I think you, you have a lot to say. So please share with us a bit of your thoughts. Yeah, so this is this is what I was saying about um, religion enables people who have an extreme psychology uh, to enact the worst parts of their psychology. To it encourages them to become more extreme, um, to take up arms against people who they think have offended their religion, who have re uh, re offended their co-religionists, offended their god. Um, and so the religion allows them to use, to direct their psychological anger and their fear of uncertainty, their fear of doubt by asserting objective, their objective um, reality, which is that, you know, that there is only one God. God has given down these laws. Uh, mankind must follow these laws. If you do not follow these these laws, um, not only you but other people will be going to hell for eternity. And so, therefore, anything that I do to punish you or to correct your speech is justified because I am saving not only myself and my children from hell. I am also uh, enacting God's will. And so, you do find you do find that some. Um, uh, the, this is the uh, and the problem. I would say the problem because I talk about the Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris, and the, one of the problems is not just the extremists because at least the extremists are doing what they're saying they're doing. At least they're following the beliefs. The beliefs are written down. I think it's very difficult to argue that they are not true Muslims because they are taking many examples from their holy books and their holy scriptures. They're following many things that have been said to them by their religious leaders. Um, many of the things that they believe in are actually religious laws that are instituted in other countries. Um, they're enacting blasphemy laws which are punished by governments in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and so forth. So they're not extremists because they are, in some respect, following the word of their God as they understand it. 
one of the biggest problems is actually the way that the liberal society says um, you can have free speech, but just don't use it. You can say whatever you want about uh, Islam, but don't do it for the sake of social, because we have social cohesion problems. So if you say that, that's really responsible. And we can't stop extremists from killing you or punishing you. So in a way, it's basically the, the, the middle class liberal left who run, who are the political class, who are the media class. Um, is a, basically a, their way of saying, oh, well, you know, we don't want to censor you. We just don't want you to say anything irresponsible. Um, and so that's basically not defending free speech at all. It's, yeah. it's completely giving it in, giving into it. And at least the extremists say, we don't want you to have free speech. The liberal <laughs> left who's running the media and the politi and politics are saying, oh, we do want you to have free speech. We're just not, no, we're not going to support you or protect you or, you know. So, uh, yeah, so I see, I see the biggest problem there as not being the extremists, but being the people who are enabling the extremists. Because I think that if you do say, oh, don't say certain things for, cert for social cohesion reasons, you're basically saying, we don't really want you to have free speech. Yeah, I think in your book you said the problem is because the politicians now lost the principles of governing with the principles of in the Enlightenment, that is free speech, in, in a free market of, uh, of thoughts. Because, like you said before, you can suggest anything in free speech that is, is not uh, inciting uh, violence, because that is not free speech. So just to put it out yep. and then you can say anything there. Even you can say like cancel culture thing. We don't want to cancel cancel culture. That is something that I mentioned with, uh, with the talk with Peter Bogosian. He's like pointing out like we don't want to cancel cancel culture. We don't want to burn books. We don't want to burn Bibles. We don't want to do things that will shut the other people up. We want a free market and a free speech. So you can't put anything out that is not inciting violence to any people, to anybody. And then people will come pass by your stuff in the wall, in your wall, and will say, oh, it's good or it's a bad idea. And the good ideas will be pushed up and the bad ideas are going to die. Very few people are going to believe. And of course, we're going to always have racists and, you know, bigots or in any ways, individuals. That is the free of the individuality, you know, the freedom yeah. of the individual. Col Col Coleman Hughes said something very interesting. He, he talked about um, the, the anti-racists. So you have non-racists, so and then you have anti-racists, and then you have non-racists. So non-racists <laughs> are basically people who don't think about race at all. They try and judge people by their own merits. So this is like liberal, centrist, the majority of all normal people, even on the right wing, who are just generally conservative. They generally think they just look at people's character they don't look at people's skin color and then you've got racists who, re who really are bigots um yeah and then you have the anti-racists and these are the people who who believe as, as Coleman Hughes says he believed that they believe that that racism is actually something that you can actually exterminate you can remove it it's like smallpox that there will be there will be there, uh, at some point if they use power correctly there would just be one last remaining racist and then he will die out and then racism will be defeated forever. And he says, no, no, this is ridiculous. This is, this is something that comes up through human biology and culture and stuff. And you can't oh, that is it. a is a type of witch hunt that I yeah. mentioned to and, my friend, because if she always going to find one racist or one misogynist to say that the system is still racist or misogynist, is, this fight will never end up because we yeah. probably going to always fight. I even have talked against the laws against the laws towards uh, hate speech because I don't think we can measure people's intentions. You know, that's not the purpose of the law. The law judges evidence, so results of things. And and it's 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 such a parallel conversation with and, the pragmatists and, and, and so, postmodernists. So yeah. So just to finish up, so Coleman Hughes says basically the anti-racists are authoritarians and they are com they are idealists. And they're completely unrealistic. They they just not, they don't really perceive um, the way human nature is. And it's good 
to have laws against against racial profiling. It's good to have laws against racial discrimination in hiring and in all those other areas. And he says that these are, this is the best thing we can do. And the rest of it is you have a you have a clear, transparent system where you cannot have overt discrimination, and you try and discourage uh, um, sub sub um, covert um, uh, prejudice and so forth. But you have to leave it. But you have to recognise that. You're not going to be able to exterminate racism the same way you can get rid of smallpox. Yeah, that's definitely. And then we come with the multiculturalism because it's just so into it. How do we live into multiculturalism when we do have those external forces coming and actually trying to change the shape of the place where they are coming? And and I put a parallel talking about. The, immigration and the immigration that some people do I, I, or let's say that immigration can be done in two different categories you can come to the place i believe i've done this i believe my grandparents families gr my great grandparents done that have done that when they came from japan to brazil they adopted the culture they already had the same values so that is also something i i believe it clashes with the islamists you know because they don't have the same value so we don't have even the same base so they would not have to adopt only culturally but uh, morally the moral values are not the same and and how they also really want to change that's how they are have been trying to do here in canada we already have jihadists <laughs> let's say like that uh, uh, and their politics because is that their way to change the shape of the politics? And I think you guys are much ahead on that sh changing shapes and having no go zones and stuff going around there. So please, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, this is this is where you you should be talking to someone like Sargon uh, because he's, he's <laughs> much more up on this sort of. <laughs> yeah. So we should put out a call out call out to Sargon to Carl Benjamin to come onto your show and discuss this with you. Um, I, I don't I don't have a solution. Um, I think it's I think it's a big problem. I think you're right that when you invite when you invite or at least accept people who come from a different culture into your own culture, there has to be an understanding that they're not coming to change things and that they are coming to adapt to at least a certain degree and that they have to accept that a lot of the cut the lot of the the culture that they came from, they cannot transplant because it's not, uh, it's not compatible. So obviously with some cultures it works better than with others. So some cultures have, have integrated very well. So for example, the uh, interestingly, the, the uh, Indian Hindu community and the Hindu Sikh community have integrated very well in British life and they've become very prosperous and um, yeah, we uh, have quite, pr quite patriotic. And I know that you have the same in Canada. Yeah, yeah, Whereas the Whereas the Muslims from India less so, uh, and I don't I don't know what the solution is. I just hope that we can find a, a I tolerant think, I way. I think we proceed. do have all the tools already. We do have laws. We just need to stick with those principles, you know. And if the, like it said, the politicians need to make the principles and values work or be applied. So. We are welcoming everybody. If you're ready to adopt our culture, our values, you're very welcome. But don't do Justin Trudeau in Canada, cultural relativists, that we will allow Muslims to bring minors to get married. And like, wait a minute, pedophilia is crime. Oh, but you know, their culture, we can't tell them how to live. It's like, no, no, here we can. If they want to live the way that they want, they have to live over there. They have the option. Nobody made them come here, but here they have to live now. The, 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 big, the biggest problem is, well, I mean, you have two problems with the, pol the, politi the politicians and the media. The, they have, the, they, they don't follow in The religious the freedom and uh, in true is not true freedom. It's a benefit. It's a religious card. It's a religious and, card to be able to do any crime and, under your belief and also that they are they're so frightened of being called racist this is this is the worst this is the worst thing yeah no they, you can see Max Silver here that is the person that stands for principles here he is shut down by the media as being 
a white supremacist, a racist and bigot, uh, whatever. It's really hard. The conversation is complicated. I really would like to talk to Sargon because he covers it so well that he is into politics as well. And I hope I hope he can. I know he is going to grow because he is reasonable. And and I think the only answer is secularism and objectivism and individual morals, individual objective morals. So I, 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 I look up to talk soon with Sar, um, with Yaron Brook. And I, I, I largely agree with you. I am my one reservation is that I think the problem with uh, having a widespread atheist attitude in society is that it leaves you open to the pseudo religions of feminism, of social justice, of race activism, and they pursue those as yes. as, as pseudo religions. They have their holy texts. They have their prophets. They have their they have their leaders, they but have I their institutions, the they have their charities. This new discussion we enter has been around since Jordan Peterson came around and talking about how we need this this super powerful God to lead us morally and actually englobed a lot of people that have called themselves atheists before to come back to theism because we need a, a, a superior moral guide. And I think that is all related to Sargon and to Yarenbrook because uh, uh, people that are in atheists are very lost into this idea of morals, but it's just because they lack and need more philosophy. So I would say like Iron Man and understand that we are able, you know, I've talked to some people about this, like human beings are able to be good or bad. The only thing that will make you make those decisions on being good or bad, it's your brain. It should not come from a religious book, doesn't matter which one, and not from pragmatism, from the postmodernist that, oh, everything is possible, because those are very arbitrary and subjective things. So the same way that the religious Christians think that all Christians are good, we can find so many people doing bad things and justifying for okay, I, with the religion. I, okay. We'll, we'll change or, or being good, basically, not even using it to justify. But then if he, tomorrow he, cha he, he thinks that he's believing in the wrong God and he gets taken by the Islamist movement, he will think that cutting people's head off is, is fine and it's good for, because of God is good. And that's why we need all to, to walk towards to an objective morality because yeah with your brain only and basically two simple principles that i think george carlin had put in jokes very well it's individual property and rights it's just your body and the things you have and as soon as everybody will respect that in the type of like i said secular everywhere it, it will be just fine we can be all fine yeah except i give you the example of sam harris most one of the most famous atheists who has completely gone off he's gone off his head on trump derangement syndrome and he's post and he i'm not he, sure he, here, here, to... is, here is here is the most logical rational calm person this this sort of this cl clear thinking uh enlightenment atheist and here he is in his with Trump derangement syndrome, and he's and he's post facto <laughs> trying, to, rash, trying to rationalize trying to rationalize syndromes going through uh, psychological stress and not behaving properly. I would say like I don't want to make it's just a joke. Let me say before <laughs> maybe 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 Sun Harris used too much of the teas and psychedelic things. <laughs> it's just a joke. <laughs> I really enjoy his talks, and I really don't know. I, I know a lot of people have talked about it. I have not followed, every, like I said, I can't follow everybody so close. I really enjoy some talks. And uh, I think it's important. Maybe he lost a little bit the track with m more because of that. But I think as well, because <laughs> he he has a problem on understanding maybe the, the, the determinism and, and other people to understand maybe the point that Maybe he's putting, I don't know, maybe my analysis of it, it's wrong. I have changed throughout time. But, but you know, no. when I talked to Raka, and Raka is very into objectivism, and I expected to be able to talk to Sargonax, 
uh, Raka pointed out, I think I didn't even cut because our conversation was very cut. I, I was starting, I was trying to edit. He did not want to answer a bunch of questions and end up cutting a lot. So it's very clipped and I did not like the result. So that's why will be like some mistakes and stuff and I will not cut and edit it all. But he mentioned that Sargon could not reach the objective morality of Iron Man because he would not believe or understand the selfishness as the most important thing for humans. Okay, for well, humans. I, I would say, but you've got this example of Sam Harris, who's one of the most intelligent, educated, calm, supposedly rational people who has got this emotional fixation. And if you read your Jonathan Haidt, you know that a lot of decisions are emotional. They're to do with your temperament, to do with your, with your personal yeah. responses to other people. And you're just rationalizing it after the fact by using reasons, because you change your reasons, but basically you've got this fixation, you made an emotional decision, and then you're just rationalizing it afterwards. And I would say, if someone like Sam Harris has problems with, you know, sort of one particular issue, and he can't even admit that to himself. How are you expecting everyone else to be? No, but it's just about time. I I know he's gonna go over it. You you can see Bill Meyer went over it. I was like a totally like, my gosh, I love Bill Meyer. I hope he gets out of this de Trump derangement syndrome. I can't watch him anymore. It's not even funny. It's just so forced, and he seems to be. He's, he seems to be funny again. He's letting go, let it go, people, frozen. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, but he's, he's a mixture. He swings. So in some signs, he says, OK, well, Trump's, I don't like Trump, but he did something that that's OK. And it's OK to say that. OK, well, that's good. But then on the other hand, he's saying, oh, you know, maybe we'd be better if we if the economy crashed and millions of people were out of out of employment. And that way we would get we could get rid of Trump. <laughs> Yeah, so he wants he wants economic devastation in order <laughs> to get rid of Trump. Me. Bo's irony. <laughs> Bo's irony. You'll, you'll have to you'll have to get you're him on. Have to ask him. <laughs> because I actually have talked to James Lindsay, and, and he loves the funny uh, names people call him, and used that to entitle himself once in a while. He changed his his name on Twitter, and I mentioned him that in the book in the how to have impossible conversations, they talk and and say a bunch of bad things about the trolls. But I I see the troll as a tool sometimes to just start an inflammatory conversation. And then you can go back to normal. You know, just like troll, like, just like Titanium McGrath. Just like, yeah, we're doing. I think it's the new type of conversation because if you come serious to talk about, oh, let's talk about gun control or abortion. People are going to start calling you names. And sometimes the only way to approach it is with comedy. That mm -hmm. also has been regressed. And and that's why I get sad sometimes to see those things. Like, I go back to old movies that are politically incorrect. <laughs> and say, like, see, we used to do that. Why can we not do this anymore? It's it's yeah. sad. It's, are we regressing? Are we walking forward in time but back culturally? Yeah. And I, I, lo I love watching uh, like old Monty Python or uh, there was uh, something called Rutland's Weekend Television. And then there was this guy who was just like an ordinary, normal guy. And he was saying, you know, I feel like I, I, I'm not enough of a minority. I don't feel like I'm a real person. And this was someone doing this. This was Eric Idle doing this in like 1974, 1975. So, it, you know, he saw he saw the way things were going. Yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's amazing. Alex, I think we have covered pretty much everything. <laughs> of course, there are always more to talk about how important is in, I think in Brazil, the new the latest conversation I was following was about meritocracy. Everybody talking about how bad meritocracy is. <laughs> and I was like, huh? I I I, I don't get it. Why? And um I think they just don't understand the term, but um, it is the idea of the equity. So nobody can be just uh, cheered by their conqueror if he's a white male. Because he might be there because he oppressed someone. He stood over some people's heads, you know, something like that. Yeah. And you, yeah, can't, it, you can't see, but I'm actually, I'm actually sitting on a pile of black lesbians. I don't have a chair here. 
I'm saying not black <laughs> lesbians and disabled people. So. I mean, <laughs> careful, pose law. <laughs> okay, people, so we pretty much cover everything now, Alex, and um, we're going to finish right here, close. Uh, Alex, please invite people to follow you and find your arts and to contact you, to make a beautiful picture or whatever. <laughs> okay. Thank, well, thank you very well. Thank you very much for the interview, Fanny. It's been you've been really well prepared, and uh, I think I've, I've had lots of fun, and so I hope the viewers me have too. had fun too. Uh, people can find me at alexanderadamsart.wordpress.com. That's for essays and interviews and links to various uh, appearances and so forth. If you want to see my art, you can go to alexanderadams.art. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I don't really do much on Twitter, but you can just um, follow my links to new articles and reviews on uh, Twitter at Adams Artist. Um, otherwise, you can buy the book, Culture War, which is available online on all um, book-selling websites. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you can also uh, go to the website of uh, Jackdaw, the Jackdaw, uh, which is an independent newsletter uh, on the fine arts. Uh, you can find some of that at thejackdoor.co.uk. Um, if you subscribe to the print version, you'll get reviews by me and by other people um, covering free speech, artistic integrity, postmodernism, identity politics, and so forth. Uh, lots of different perspectives, um, and there's more ver there's more material in the printed version than there is on in the online version. So uh, thank you again, Fanny. Thank you very much. So people go check and follow and get uh, uh, amazed by his art. It's really nice. Um, thank you very much, Alex, for coming. Thank you, everybody, for watching and see you guys next interview. Bye bye. <laughs>